Good morning. morning. Excited about being at church this Sunday morning? All right. All right. It's going to be good. Um, That's what we're talking about. We're talking about the story about Jesus walking on the water and uh, and Peter walking on the water. Um, We're in this series that we started at the beginning of the year, and it's going through the book of John, and we're calling it Living Your Best Life. And last week I was gone, and Matt, our youth pastor, preached, and he did a good job, talked about the... Who remembers, who was here and remembers what he talked about? (laughs) Feeding the 5,000. So the interesting thing about, and if you weren't here, you always go back and on our website and look at uh, last week's message. But the story is that there was, uh, that that Jesus fed 5,000 with two fish and five loaves of bread. But in reality, it was more than 5,000 because they only counted the men. And I I would insert a joke about why they only counted the men, but... I'm not going to do that because I'm not going to get in trouble with the women here. But, it's, but when, they just, when they did the tally, they had the little clicker thing there. They just counted the men. I think it was probably just easier for them. Uh, but there were also women and children there. So a lot of theologians estimate that they said it could have been as many as fifteen or 20,000 people there that got fed with just two fish and five loaves of bread. And the other interesting thing about this, Matt didn't bring this up last week, and I can't prove this. But if you read that story, there's a little boy that had two fish and five loaves of bread. And, and they took that from him and fed the multitude. But nowhere in there does it say that he voluntarily gave that to them. I'm just saying, just go look it for yourself. It's, I think that they just snatch it from him. Be like, give me that kid. What's he going to do? He's a little boy. You know what I mean? So I don't, I'm just kidding. I don't know how that went down. But, but I do know that Jesus multiplied the two fish and five loaves and fed a multitude. And that, that's what the great story was. And so, um, so this week, so this is, this is the story. Like, so the disciples, it's 12 disciples. They're in the middle of uh, the, the, the lake. The, there's, there's like five different uh, names for this lake. Sea of Galilee is probably the most common one. But there they are. They're trying to get to the other side. It's 3 o'clock in the morning, and they're, the waves are crashing in on them. They think they're going to drown, and, and they're, they're terrified. But here's what I want to try to help you kind of put yourself in the story today and, and think about it from their perspective. We know at least four of these men, four of the disciples, were professional fishermen before they became followers of Jesus, all right? Peter uh, and Andrew and James and John, they did that for a living, and they did it on that lake all the time. They, they practically lived out there. And, and so they're familiar with storms, and they've seen a lot, but this particular storm was different than anything they'd ever seen, and they were just terrified. And, and so I want to look at this story a little bit deeper and dig into the details. Now, something interesting that you got to know about this, because we're going to actually go to Mark chapter 14, if you have a, a Bible, because this story is found in three of the Gospels. So there's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, four Gospels of the telling of Jesus' life. And um, people have asked questions, like maybe you haven't grown up in church or whatever. Uh, there's a great book out there. It's an old book. It's called the Synoptic Gospels. You could probably order it online. But because a lot of people are skeptics, and they're like, Let me just help you understand something. So they're like, why are there four different Gospels, and each one's got a little bit different details about what's going on? And I always just say, like, if you and I went out here and witnessed a car accident, and the cops came and said, well, tell me what you saw. Well, your telling of the story would be a little bit different than mine. You wouldn't be wrong. You're not lying. It's just that the details that you picked up on might have been different than the ones I did. And that's how it is when you're reading through the Bible, the, the four Gospels. And so this one... The story today is found in three of the Gospels. It's in Matthew, it's in uh, Mark, and it's in the book of John. For some reason, the book of Luke didn't include it in there. Uh, There's only one story, though, about Jesus that made it into all four Gospels. Does anybody know which one it is? There's one story that was in all four Gospels. And if you were here last week, you should know that because it's the feeding of the 5,000. And I know I watched the sermon last week, and Matt specifically told you guys that. So he's going to be mad that you didn't remember. I'm just saying that. So anyway, so feeding the 5,000 is re, uh, retold in all four of the Gospels. Okay, so let's get into this. If you have a Bible, we're in Mark chapter 14. Because this story, this, this telling of the account gives a little bit more details than what the other one did in the book of John. So here we are in verse 22. It says, immediately after this, okay? So immediately after what? Do you remember? Were you here last week? So immediately after feeding the 5,000, the multitude, right? So the, the, these details are important. When you're reading through the Bible, when it says immediately after, okay, you, these, the details have 
it, it puts layers on it and it adds context to what's going on. Okay, so, so what happened last week? They fed the 5,000, they fed the multitude, they just witnessed this incredible miracle. Like, I don't even know how it happened. They're just like, there's two fish there, and there's five loaves of bread. I mean, they're not loaves of bread, like not what you think of a loaf of bread with slices, like probably like hush puppies or small little, you know, like a pita, piece of pita bread, something like that. And, and, and they took that and just kept feeding people with it. It's like, where's it coming from? It's a miracle. It's an amazing thing. And, and they witnessed that, and now the very next moment, it says immediately after this, Jesus insisted that the, the disciples get back in the boat, back into the boat, and cross to the other side while he sent uh, the people home. After sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Night fell while he was there alone. So again, these are, these are important details. Let, let's just talk about this. So they... While they have fed the multitude, 15, maybe 20,000 people just saw a miracle. Now, and the Bible also says that everybody ate as much as they want. Come on. Now, I, I know some of you have a bigger appetite than others. I can put away some stuff. I can put away some fish. I'm just telling you. And so it says that they gave, they, they had as much as they wanted. And so Jesus is sending them home. And in my mind, he's got a little doggy bag. And he's like, here you go. Take this with you. Take this with you. And they're leaving. And, and, and he tells the disciples, while I'm sending everyone home and giving them their doggy bag, I want you to get in the boat. This is what he told the disciples. I want you to get in the boat. Go to the other side. Now, they might have asked him. There's, these details aren't in there. But, but Jesus was tired. He was physically tired. He was emo emotionally exhausted because of he, had, he had a big day. You ever, everyone in this room knows what this is like, and it's probably different for everyone. Th those of us that do ministry, like, like yesterday, we were here till late last night. We did this big men's beast feast, and it was an amazing event. There were some guys here, sit, stayed here all night Friday night, like stayed up smoking this uh, pig that we, that we roasted. And they were here all night long, stayed up, didn't sleep, maybe, you know, 15 minutes here and there. And, and then all day long, they were here yesterday. So you can imagine, at the end of yesterday, there were some people that were just dog-tired, and all they wanted to do was go take a nap, right? And you've probably been there. You've probably had a day where it's emotionally tired. Now, here's, here's what I know. There's a difference between being physically tired. Like, I can work, uh, you know, you can mow the grass, you can do physical exercise or physical labor. Some of you guys do that for your job. And there's a difference between being physically exhausted and emotionally drained. You understand what I'm saying? And spiritually drained. And that's a dangerous thing. So emotionally exhausted is, is when you get peopled out. You know, everyone knows what that's like when you're, you're, like, when you're around the holidays and you got to go over to your relative's house for Thanksgiving dinner and all the, and you know there's going to be a, just a just maybe one person there that you don't like, and you try to avoid them. The whole, it's it, it's just exhausting. Or I mean, maybe the moms moms definitely in this room know what it's like to be physically and emotionally exhausted. You got little kids just tugging on you, and then and then and then you try to find an escape. What's your escape? Where where do you go to escape from your kids? Tell me, because you know where is it? The bathroom. The bathroom. Raise your hand if you've ever saw fingers underneath the door. Crawl. You know you have. My kids have done it. They're little. They're just, mommy, mommy, mommy. And you want to just chop those fingers off, but you can't do that because you go to jail. But, but you know what it's like. You just, at the end of some days, you're just physically exhausted and drained. But there's something on a different level when you're dealing with people that are maybe hard to love or people that are just, uh, people, people can wear you out. I say it like this. Jesus, and, and don't take this the wrong way, like, Jesus was human in his humanness. He got tired just like we did. He got lonely at times just like we do. He, um, you know, he had a body. You know, he was physical. He was fully God, but he was fully human. And in his fully humanness, he experienced some of the same things, some of the same emotions that you experience and I experience. And I think that on this particular day, Jesus was peopled out. You ever been peopled out? Come on, you have. You have. You're probably right now. You're like, I'm, I'm, I'm after church. I'm going home, and I'm going to my bedroom. I don't want to see anybody the rest of the day. But that's what you got to do. You got to figure out how to recharge your batteries. If you don't, you're going to always be exhausted, and eventually you will burn out. Now, everyone's got to figure out. I, I've mentioned this before. Like everyone's got different ways that you recharge your batteries. For me, it's going fishing or hunting or something like that. Jesus, his biggest thing, we see this all the time. Jesus oftentimes would send people away. He would get away from the disciples, and he would go up in the mountains and pray 
and he just was going up there to spend time with his dad is what he was doing and everyone in here the bible jesus talked about this that you got to have a prayer closet now your time alone with god might be out on a boat somewhere or it might be you know in a tree stand or it might be you know at work when no one's around or it could be in the bathroom when the kids are reaching their fingers under the you know you're trying to get some peace and quiet but everyone in here you got to figure out what recharges your batteries because everyone in here you're you're not designed to go it, it's one of the things i'm I, i'm not i didn't mean to preach on this i'm not but in my devotions I'm, I'm going through the bible in the old testament and we're going go through the whole bible in a year and right now I'm in the Old Testament, and it's a lot of, about the Sabbath. Now, we, we're not required to keep the Sabbath anymore, but the principle was God said, I want you to work six days and then rest on one day. And some of you guys, and myself included, are terrible at resting. Like just, have you ever just sat and just tried to sit still for, well, 30 minutes while I preach to you? You know, some of you guys have a hard time with that. I have a hard time with that. But, but God created us in such a way, and, and most people that I know just live at this unrealistic, fast pace that you can't keep up, and you wonder why you're always just frazzled. You're just like, I got, because God didn't create you to just go, 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 go. He expects you to take some time off and, and take some, here's the other thing, here's the other thing, especially for moms that I know, I know my wife struggled with this, feel, my wife feels guilty when she try, when, when I say, you need to take some time for yourself. Get away from everybody, the kids. She feels guilty about that. But what I know, and I always tell her this, listen, you can't feel guilty about taking time for yourself. It's the way God wired you. It's the way God created you. He wants all of us to figure out what recharges our batteries and, and, and spend time doing that. Okay, so, so that's what the story is. Jesus went up in the mountains to pray. He was peopled out. He was like, I, I got to get away. You guys are, I woke up with one nerve this morning and you already got on it. And, and, and so he went up in the mountains. He's praying. Meanwhile, at the same time, verse, here's verse 24. It says, meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land. So they're in the middle of the lake, the Sea of Galilee. It says, for a strong wind had risen and they were, uh, they were fighting heavy waves. About 3 o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them. So, right? So they're rowing across. Like, they didn't have gas-powered motors at that time. They couldn't just get in and start it up, cruise across the lake. They, they had to row. And the, wind, the, the, the winds were high, and they just they, they, they weren't making any progress. And it says about 3 o'clock in the morning, right? So when they should have been sleeping, they're just up all night, rowing and rowing and rowing, getting nowhere. It says 3 o'clock in the morning, they look over... And Jesus came toward them, walking on the water. When the disciples saw him, saw him walking on the water, they were, what's the word there? Terrified. In their fear, they cried out, it's a ghost. So they, they thought he was a ghost. I don't know if you've ever experienced something like that. I'm sure some of you guys, most of you guys have stayed up till 3 o'clock in the morning, stressing out about something. But if you've ever, like, looked out in the distance and thought you saw a ghost or or whatever, saw something scary. I mean, they're just, they're terrified. And I just want you to see this. Here's another thing. This is just a little side note here. So this story I told you is found in three different Gospels, okay? Matthew, the one we're looking at, and then John, the one we originally looked at. The one in Mark is, is really interesting because it says, and you can just make note of that and go look at that later. But in Mark chapter 6, it says this. It says that they were in the boat, and it says Jesus was walking on the water. And it says he intended on walking past them. Which I don't know what that's about. I think he's just messing with them. Like I think they're just, they're, they look, it's a ghost. And Jesus is like, hey, what's up? And he just kept walking. And, and just to terrify him. And then he turns back and he's like, okay. But, but it's a, it just says that. It says that he intended to walk past them. Now verse 27, it says, but Jesus spoke to them at once. Now look what he says. This, these details are important for, for you and for me. Like I take a lot of solace in this. Uh, he says, don't be afraid. He said, don't, or he says, take courage, I am here. Isn't that great? He says, there they are terrified. They're, they think that they're going to drown in this boat because they've been in that type of water before. They've never seen a storm like this. They've never seen the waves that high. And they're terrified. Then they see a ghost, what they think is a ghost, and it's Jesus. And Jesus goes, don't be afraid. He says, take courage. And what I, what I want to say, just a little side note on this, just a little time out, is that everyone in this room, you go through storms of life. We do. I do, and you do. And at times, you might feel like you're all alone and you're terrified. And one of the reasons, one of the worst parts about going through storms is if you feel like even God is not listening. Like you try to pray, 
and you're like, my prayers aren't, are bouncing off the ceiling. I can't even, I don't feel God's presence right now. And that's true. I don't know anybody, myself included, that doesn't have periods of time where that doesn't happen, right? So there's times that we go through life and we don't feel God's closeness, his, his presence with us. But just because that's the way you feel doesn't mean that's reality. You understand what I'm saying? Jesus is always, like in that moment, back to the story, there they are, they had their oars and they're rowing, 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 they think they're going to die. Jesus was right over there the whole time. They couldn't see him, but he was there the whole time. And in your storms of life, you can't always see Jesus, but he's always there. He's never going to walk away from you. The Bible says he'll never leave us, he'll never forsake us. And that's what I love about having a relationship with God, is even though I feel like sometimes God's not there, I know intuitively, that's why if you're not a Bible person, if you are a Christian and you don't read the Bible, you're going to be missing out on this because sometimes I'll read it and I'll go, okay, I just need to be reminded of that. I mean, I've been doing this for 25 years and I sometimes need God to remind me, hey, I'm still here. Hey, I'm still with you. I haven't left. I'm right here. You're not going to drown. This is not the end for you. Okay. Don't make a mountain out of a molehill. Just, just calm down. He says, don't be afraid. Take courage. It's going to be okay. And then let's go on with the story. Verse, 20, verse 28 says, Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. In verse 29. I love this. Jesus said, uh, Jesus, uh, Jesus said, come. Yes, come. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water towards Jesus. Now, I love this. I, like when I read through the Bible, Jesus had 12 disciples. And Peter was my favorite. And uh, I don't know who your favorite is. Hopefully it's not Judas. If your favorite is Judas, we, you need to come talk to me. Uh, but, but my favorite is, is Peter for several reasons. One is Peter had foot and mouth disease. You, ever, you know what that is? So he would open his mouth and insert his foot sometimes. I, I have a problem with that. Sometimes I, like, sometimes I speak and then think. I should, I'm trying to train myself to think and then speak. But anyways, um, and that's hard when I'm preaching. But um, but, but I love that because Peter would always say the wrong thing. Peter would always just say something and go, yeah, I probably shouldn't have said that. And, and then the other thing about Peter, though, that I love is he was a risk taker. There's, there's something different about Peter than the rest of the group. There were 12 guys in that boat, and 12 guys were terrified, and all 12 of them saw Jesus and goes, this is a ghost. Oh, no, it's, it's Jesus. And only one of them had the, the courage I call it childlike faith. Only one of them had enough faith to go, to even dare to ask, Jesus, let me walk on the water. I mean, think about it. I, I don't know if you would have come up with that. I don't know if I would have come up with that. But I want you to think about that just for a minute because the Bible talks about that and calls it childlike faith. And that's how I like to think about it. Because I, I feel like a lot of times, the older we get, uh, adults have a harder time believing in God than children do. Okay? Be because of our experiences and because we let other people influence us and we're listening to the wrong people and reading the wrong things. But you take a child, take a child and teach them the stories of the Bible and tell them about God. They're not, they're not going, no, that could never happen. Because children have an imagination. They have, we call it childlike wonder. Like they just, yeah, God is awesome. And then we talk to those same stories about adults and they're going, well, in my experience, I've never seen anybody walk on water. Well, if there's a God in heaven that can do all things, somebody certainly could walk on water. But there's something about that childlike faith. And I just want to encourage you, if you've left that, if you have gotten away from having childlike faith, you need to get back to that. You need to just go back to going, man, if God said it, I'm going to believe it and I'm going to do it. If God told me to do something, I'm just going to do it. I don't, I don't need to have it all planned out, right? Because they're, the, they're, they're there in the middle of the lake and they didn't, you know, they didn't know what was happening. They just knew my master, Jesus, said, get in the boat, go to the other side of the lake. I'm going to come back to this in a little bit, but I want you to think about this too. Just put on your thinking cap about the fact that why were they so fearful, okay? Um, Jesus, in this, in this passage, Jesus told them, get in the boat, go to the other side of the lake, and I'm going to meet you there. I got to go up on the mountain, and I'm going to pray. He didn't tell them when he was going to meet them there. He didn't tell them how long it was going to take, but they had direct orders. So think about it like this. Just imagine that God told you or Jesus told you, today after church, I want you to get in your car and I want you to drive to Springfield, Missouri, and I'll meet you there. Okay? First of all, would you do it or would you, or would you not do it? You could, would you rationalize and go, that's crazy. Why would God tell me to do that? Or would you just obey? Now, on the way there, would you be, 
would, you, would it even enter your mind that you're terrified that somebody's going to crash into you and die on the way to Springfield, Missouri? Like if you heard an audible voice, if you heard from God this booming voice, I want you to get in your car and drive to Springfield, Missouri, and I'm going to meet you there. I think some people would still be, you know, gripping the wheel going, I hope I don't die on the way there. Like, like it's all about child. Like a child would not doubt that at all. They would just be like, hey, my dad said to meet him in Springfield, Missouri. That's where I'm going. But there's something about adults that learn how to distrust God and learn how to, we, we lose faith. Okay, if God told you to do something, he's going to do it. So God, Jesus told the disciples, go to the other side of the lake, I'll meet you there. I got to go spend time with my dad. And meanwhile, they're in the middle of the lake, and because there's winds and there's waves, and they think they're going to die, they're terrified. But if they would have just remembered, right, all you have to do is remember what the promise was, or what the command was, that we're going to the other side of the lake. Do you really think Jesus would have let them drown? I mean, the it, it's so crazy. So let, let's, um, let's go back to this for a minute, uh, Peter being a risk taker. Uh, I, I just want to encourage you guys to, whatever God says, if, if God tells you to do something, I want you to see this. If God tells you to do something, it's going to be by faith. The Bible says that the just walk by faith. That's how we're supposed to live. So if you say, I need, I need an answer from, from God, and I want God to speak into my life, he's going to speak to you. And he's going to ask you to do something that makes you very uncomfortable. It's going to take you out of your comfort zone. That's one of the reasons why you know that's, that, that you're in the will of God. Is that otherwise you wouldn't need to ask God for it. You could just do it yourself. You know. Let me give you, with that said, I've got four things I want you to write down. These are four observations about this. Number one, number one is uh, most people will never walk on water because they're afraid to take risks. So for the rest of this time that we spend together, whenever I say walking on water, I don't mean literally walking on water. I'm not, I don't think anyone here has ever walked on water. I, it, I'm talking about a metaphor for faith. Has, has anyone ever walked on water? Anyone? This week? Let's, I, I actually did last week. Uh, me, me and a couple of buddies were ice fishing up in Minnesota, and I was walking on the, I was. It was frozen, but it's still water, and I walked on it. So... Go to this next slide. Here's one. This is a funny one. This little girl's walking on water. If she can do it, you can do it. And then I have this. This is just a funny video. Um, I, I showed this before. Uh, they've done this uh, prank. This is just a prank of walking on water. Let's watch this. I love that first guy's reaction. He didn't know what to think. He thought it was really Jesus. He was like, I don't know what's going on here. But uh, so going back to the walking on water, when I say walking on water for you, you're probably, God's probably not going to ask you to literally walk on water, but he is going to ask you to do some things in faith, and it makes you very uncomfortable. And so here's the reality of this. Most people that I know, most Christians are going to live their whole life and never when I talk about walking on water, it's experiencing God's power. It's seeing God do miracles in your life. And most people I know are never going to experience that because they're scared to take risks. And people are scared to take risks because they, they're overcome with fear. Okay, Fear will paralyze you. Fear will 
keep you, just stop you in your tracks and keep you from doing anything that God's called you to do. And so think about this. Fear is the opposite of faith. You can't have both. You can't, you can't simultaneously be in faith and in fear. It's one or the other. So this week, when you are faced with whatever you're faced with, and you're overcome, overcome with terror or anxiety or you know, you're, you're just paralyzed with fearfulness for whatever reason, you have to understand that in that moment, that's not faith. You're not operating in faith. Because in those moments, whenever, whatever you're scared of, if you just remember that the creator of the universe is your heavenly father and he loves you and he's got it all under control, then that should settle your nerves down. And it, but I'm, not, I'm not trying to browbeat anybody because there's times where I feel that too. I feel that anxiety. I feel fearful sometimes. And God just reminds me, Joey, you're, you're not trusting me. If you, if you are fearful, it means you're not trusting God. You can't have both at the same time. And I think we all struggle with that at times, but we, it's something we have to get over and we have to learn to trust God. So back to the story. Verse 30 says, when, but, but when he saw that, so there Peter is, back to the story. Peter's walking on the water. He had enough courage and childlike faith to say, Jesus, if that's you, let me come, walk into, to, let me come out on the water and walk to you. And Jesus says, come on. In verse 30, but when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was, what's the word there? He was terrified. And then what happened? He began to, he began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Now, let me ask you a question. What happened? What happened? What changed? He's walking on water. He's walking on water to Jesus. And what happened? What changed? He took his eyes off Jesus. And what did he put him on? He put him on the problem. He put him on the waves and the, the storm, which was irrelevant. It was irrelevant to the whole story. Go to this next slide. I got this funny meme that I came across this week. It just said, let go of your doubt, Peter. Right? So, um, because that's what happened in verse 31. Th verse 31 says, Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. Now, I've got these two pictures I want to show you. These are, I don't know where these came from. I've seen them all over the internet. They're great. Go to this first one. This is, this is a beautiful picture. I don't know if this is somebody's painting or what this is. Somebody will probably come up and tell me what it is. Uh, but isn't this, isn't this just a beautiful picture? Because this is what it is. This, when you see the person underneath, that's, that's your hand. Okay? There's times where you are underwater. Your head is underwater. You're gasping for air, for, for a breath. And there's somebody who says, J Jesus is like, all you got to do is cry out to me. All you got to do is cry out, and I'm there. And he reaches down, and he grabs us. He's not going to let us drown. Go to the next one. This is another beautiful picture, this, this one of Jesus reaching into the water. I, I love that. I've seen that all around. But it's, for me, it's just reassuring to know that God is in control. I'm not. <laughs> I know that I'm not in control all of the time, any of the time. But Jesus, the creator of the universe, is. So number two, the second thing I want you to write down is when you are in trouble, cry out for help. And you may not like this, but listen to me, listen to me. There's times where you may be so overwhelmed with anxiety. Think about Peter, okay? There was howling winds, the waves. He thinks he's dying. He's, he's walking towards Jesus. You know, it's like a mountaintop moment, and then he goes to sinking, and he thinks he's going to drown. And what does he do? He screams out. I, th I don't think he went, hey, Jesus, help, help me. He screamed out for help. And there's times that you might need to do that. And that's okay. There's times where you just have to let your emotions take over and just scream your prayer to God. And it doesn't have to be a complicated prayer. You don't have to go, oh, Heavenly Father, thou art so good and great. No, no, just say, Lord, help me. Lord, save me. That's a prayer right there. That's a prayer of help. And, and God always hears our prayers, and he'll step in immediately. It says immediately he reached out and took his hand. Now, um, and then after that, so this takes a little bit of a turn, and Jesus just looks at him. He goes, you have, after he pulled him up, he says, you have so little faith, Jesus said. He goes, why did you doubt me? Now, when I read that, I just, let me help you understand this from my perspective. I, I think that God, I think God has feeling. I know Jesus did when he was fully human and fully God. In his hum humanity, he had feelings. He, um, he got exhausted just like you get exhausted. He, he, he dealt with disappointments. He dealt with loneliness. He, he, when he was on the cross, 
he said, my, my father, my father, why have you forsaken me? In that moment, he felt like his dad had turned his back on him and all of that had to happen in order for him to pay for your sin debt. But, but he under, I'm just telling you, Jesus understands the stuff that you go through because he experienced those same emotions. Um, but, but, I, but I believe that God, I, I believe that God takes that personal. So in other words, so in, the, in your moments where you've been overcome with anxiety and, and you doubt, God takes that personally. Because what, what he's saying is, oh, you don't trust in me. You don't believe I'm good. You don't believe that I can fix your situation. You, you believe that the waves are stronger than Jesus. That's what you believe. And when you're, when you're doubting, when you're going through your, your problems and you're, you're filled with anxiety and stress and all of these things and you're fearful and you're doubting that God's going to come through, God's like, now, now listen, have I ever not come through for you? I mean, seriously, everyone in this room, you're here. You haven't died yet. Like you, every single time, every person in this room, every time you've asked God for help, He's helped you every single time. There's never been not one time where God didn't come through for you. So why is it that right now the thing you're going through, you think, well, I don't know if God can do it this time, as if he's not the creator of the universe. He's still the same God that helped you the last time and the time before that, and he's helped everybody on planet Earth, right? And he, he comes through. But there's something about us and our humanity. We just doubt God. And I think Jesus just, I, in this one, I think he just sighed. He was like, Peter. Wait, who do you think I am? Do you not, do you not just see that I fed the 5,000? Do you not see me he, you know, heal this blind guy? Do you not see me give this deaf person his hearing? Do you not see me bring Lazarus back from the dead? Did you see all these things, witnessed it with your eyes, and you still doubt that I'm God? What, what is wrong with us? Well, we're human, and we, we doubt. So I want, I want to, this number three, I want to just drill down on this one just for a few minutes, um, about a minute. Uh, the security comes from the command. And I want you to think about this in terms of what Jesus said. When Jesus, after the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus was sending them away with doggy bags. And he said, the disciples, I want you to get in the boat, go to the other side, I'll meet you over there. Okay, so that was the command. They heard it with their own ears that Jesus is going to meet us on the other side. So why are they doubting in the midst? Because if we have a command from God that we're going to be meet him. It goes back to what I said. If God tells you to get in your car and drive to Springfield, you're going to get to Springfield if you just drive. You're not going to get hit by a bus on the way there and die. You're not going to go off into the, you know, off of a cliff and die. You're going to make it because God told you to do that. God and 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 when you doubt that, you doubt that God is good. Like you doubt that um that, that God has got your best interest at heart. Think, think about this. So what, what did they think in that moment? Okay, back to the story. There's Jesus walking on the water, and there's Peter. Peter goes, Lord, if it's really you, let me come to you walking on water. Jesus says, come on. So he's walking to Jesus, and then he starts to s slip and fall. Now, I wonder what the disciples were thinking. I wonder what Peter was thinking. Did, you know, just imagine a different story how it goes. Okay, Peter's walking on the water, and he sees the waves, and he drowns. And Jesus is just standing there on the water going, let this be a lesson to you guys, not to doubt, right? Or whatever. He's not going to let him drown. Or, or I just imagine he, Peter drowns and he looks at the disciples and he's like, see, he borrowed my sandals without asking me. And this is what happens when you do it. Or so, whatever. I don't, but God is not vindictive. God's not trying to get it back at us. God's not trying to kill us. He's not walking around with a club waiting to hit us over the head. He is your heavenly father, and he loves you. He's only got good things in store for you. And but we doubt those things, and we doubt, even though he came through last time, we doubt that he's going to do it this time. Let, let's finish out the story. This is the last one. Verse 32 says, when they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. Immediately, the wind stopped. Then the disciples worshiped him, and they said, this is what they said, you really are the son of God. Now, I... I know we're already past time, so I don't want to take a long time. But how crazy is it if you read through the Bible, every single time this happens, whenever Jesus would do a miracle, the disciples would say, well, now we really believe because you did this. Like, really? Bringing that guy back from the dead wasn't good enough for you? Feeding the 5,000 wasn't good enough for you? It was the waves that did it? Was, it was seeing Peter walk on water that finally did it for you? Which it didn't do that before, because if you know the rest of the story, they go on for another probably couple years, and, and then Jesus is hung on the cross. And when Jesus was hung on the cross dying, all of these guys abandoned them and said, he evidently isn't the guy we thought. It, it wasn't enough for us to see him raise Lazarus from the dead. It wasn't enough for us to see him 
heal blind people and deaf people and feed multitudes. None of that's enough, okay, because, because of our current situation. And all I'm telling you is if God was good enough for you last time, then he's good enough for you this time, okay? Here's the last thing, number four. I want to end with this thought, this idea. The key to walking on water, walking on water for you is whatever God's telling you to do is to keep your eyes on Jesus. The problem is we take our eyes off Jesus and we put them on our problems. And we think, my problem's bigger than Jesus. Now, I want to show you this video. This is, uh, uh, I could have just stole this video, this sermon illustration. But this guy, I don't even know who this guy is. He's a pastor in Los Angeles. Uh, and I came across it on the internet. I just thought this is a really powerful illustra- illustration. And it's talking about similar to what we're talking about. So let's watch this. Our fearless uh, hanging air freshener. If you don't have one of those, get one. They're, they're awesome. And this is the car next to me. Now, let me ask you this question. Which one's bigger? The air freshener. In my perspective. So if the air freshener is bigger, how did it fit in my car? It didn't. Get bigger because it was in my car. It's bigger because I'm closer to it. So how is fear so much bigger than my God? How is anxiety so much bigger than my God? If, if, you're, if your problem is big and your God is small, it's not that your God is small and your problem is big. It's that you're sitting closer to your problem than you are to your God. Look, the moment we start getting in God's presence, it's not that He changes sizes. It's that we see how big He is for the first time. I love that because it is a matter of perspective, the stuff that you're going through. And I just want to wrap up with this and just want you to think about a matter of perspective. Everyone in here goes through the storms of life. Everyone in here. And, and are you closer to the problem? Do you got your eyes on the problem or do you got your eyes on Jesus? Go to this next slide. I want to show you this. This is a meme. This is a quote that I came across. I've posted this before. Was it a bad day or was it a bad five minutes that you milked all day? Think about that tomorrow when you're at work. Think about that this week when you go through something and it's, it's an interaction with a coworker or a family member or something happens to you just for a split moment and then you just milk that all day long. You, you allow one small thing to just ruin your whole day. Or I've talked to people that are like, oh, it's been a terrible week. Really? Because of probably one five, five minutes of a bad time, you, you let that ruin your whole week? Just people it ruined a bad month. Last year sucked. It was just a bad year. Really? Because a couple bad things happened, right? You, it's a matter of perspective. You have to learn to put your eyes on Jesus. So 